Welcome to this webinar on the efficacy of topical oxygen. Today, we're going to focus on meta-analysis of the, all the evidence that we put together for topical oxygen. Again, I'm going to reiterate, if you have any questions, type them in the chat box. We'd love to address them. I'm Tom Serena. I am the founder and chief medical officer of Serena Group, Inc., a family of wound and hybrid uh, uh, centers that stretches across the United States. Most of our research is done in our research uh, foundation, and you can read the rest. Uh, I'm not going to go over uh, the, the remainder of my in introduction. As far as disclosure, I work with a lot of different companies. Uh, most of this is related to the research that we do. And if you have interest in research, uh, type that in the chat box, and we can talk about that as well. We're certainly are always looking for investigators, folks interested in things like studying uh, topical oxygen. Again, the focus of today is on the evidence for topical oxygen, and a lot of this has been produced in, in the recent uh, past, and uh, Dr. Carter will go over uh, meta-analysis and how it's done, and if you haven't done one of these, I think it's really something that is a great exercise. It's intense, but it is a tremendous learning experience, and I really felt like I, I went to school working with Dr. Carter and the rest of the great team that put together this meta-analysis. So how do we make a decision about what products to use? Well, it, we know that we try to uh, stay on the evidence-based pyramid. And I think that really started with John Hunter, one of my surgical heroes. And if you haven't read John Hunter's biography, do so. It's absolutely fascinating and fabulous. And as you all know, uh, he was uh, the inspiration for Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, one of the first surgeons not to be a barber surgeon, but one of the unique characteristics of John Hunter was they believed in evidence, collecting evidence, using that evidence to, to design surgical procedures and to treat diseases specifically. And we really need to do that and adopt this in wound care. Uh, if you, There's a lot of guidelines out there. Unfortunately, many of them are based on expert opinion, and, and that's not a criticism of guidelines. I, <laughs> I've written a lot myself. But we, as wound care specialists, we need to focus on driving uh, uh, the evidence for the products that we use on our patients who are very sick to the highest quality. And if you look at the evidence-based pyramid, as you go up the pyramid, you see that you get more and more reliable evidence. And at the top of the pyramid is uh, meta-analysis, you know, RCTs, and then multiple RCTs that can be put together, as we've done here, and develop a meta-analysis, then grade that evidence. And I think you'd be really interested in the results that we got for topical auction. I was actually, although I'm a, a, a huge proponent of topical auction and I've done clinical trials uh, in uh, that are included in this meta-analysis, I was really pleased to see the results being so positive uh, for this therapy. There's no doubt that we need more evidence for the tr our various treatments uh, for our diabetic foot ulcer patients. We know what the morbidity and mortality is for a patient with a diabetic foot ulcer increases your risk of death by 47% per year. And that was shown in a large Norwegian or Scandinavian study. So let's take a look at topical oxygen. This is really going to be my role. I'm going to, I wanted to introduce the meta-analysis and tell you how important it was and how it's important that we use evidence to guide our decisions in the wound clinic. In addition, I just want to take a few minutes and go over the proposed mechanism of action of topical oxygen. Why? Well, because I get this question a lot. You know, many of you know that I'm a, I'm a, uh, I'm a hyperbaric physician as well, and uh, I, we run hyperbaric centers across the, across the world now. And so I'm a big proponent of hyperbaric. I don't think these, I don't think topical oxygen and hyperbaric are, are, are competitive. They work by a different mechanism of action. And I think they are both important in addressing uh, the healing of a diabetic foot ulcer, something we need to continue to improve. So let's take a little look at uh, the mechanism of action. I put this into three basic groups. There is an antimicrobial effect, and this is probably something we know the most about, and some great work that's been done on changing the microbiome by adding uh, oxygen. We know that cells obviously need energy in order to function normally. And in a chronic wound uh, with hypoxia, cells do not function normally. You can increase en energy production by adding exogenous uh, um, oxygen. And then finally, topical oxygen will also promote epithelialization. Uh, keratinocytes love oxygen. 
And this is something we can use this topical modality for in order to promote the closure and epithelialization of the wound. And I mentioned diabetic foot ulcers, but I think at this point, uh, we're really talking about venous leg ulcers. One of the reasons I think that we see such a pain reduction with topical oxygen as well is most likely uh, this change in antimicrobial effect along with the promotion of epithelialization. Now, this is a bit of theory. Most of the mechanism that we do is theory. Of course, we have we have ev some evidence to support it. We're gathering more all the time. So let's address the antimicrobial effect. The, the topical oxygen, it may not work like an antibiotic, but it is anti, uh, antimicrobial. And what do I mean by that? What I mean is that your own immune system, the immune cells, leukocytes need oxygen in order to be effective. In a low oxygen environment, and neutrophils just simply don't work very well because they concentrate oxygen and then use that oxygen uh, to kill bacteria, the so-called oxygen burst. And so you can see that trilobe nucleus consistent with a neutrophil here, and it has this uh, organelle, the phagosome, which will engulf the bacteria, and then it will use free oxygen radicals. Free oxygen radicals, if we have free oxygen radicals, then we really need oxygen in order as the source to develop free oxygen radicals. And that's what happens here. And it's been well studied that neutrophils function better in the in a high oxygen environment. Basically, the higher the oxygen tension in the tissue, the more uh, effective the neutrophils are in eliminating bacteria. I personally think this is the one of the main mechanisms of topical oxygen, locally uh, having diffused oxygen into the wound, having the immune cells that are present within the wound work more uh, effectively. And I think there's there's uh, certainly evidence for this when you look at the oxygen literature. So when you look at steps to wound chronicity, how do wounds become chronic? Well, first of all, it's comorbidities. Our patients have a tremendous number of comorbidities. It's estimated that the average wound care patient has 10 comorbidities. So we start with this phase one, which is colonization of the wound and the development of bacterial setting up house in the wound. And then it transitions into biofilm, first immature, then mature biofilms. And this is what has been called the third phase, the polymicrobial biofilm that's mature in the wound, very difficult uh, to eradicate. And I think when you look at the flora, the microbiome is very different depending on what phase you're in. And that's important because topical oxygen can play an important role in changing the microbiome. So the point of uh, topical oxygen is to shift this backwards. And certainly when you shift it backwards, the bacteria are e more easily uh, destroyed. Some work by Karen Cross looked at the changing microbiome and, and healing. So what you see is changes in the microbiome induced by topical oxygen. And you see the, the difference in uh, the types of bacteria. And this is some really uh, interesting work and it's work that's being expanded on as we speak, but it, this clearly plays a role. Topical oxygen, whether it's through the uh, enhancement of the immune function or uh, some other effect that we don't yet clearly understand, but topical oxygen changes the microbiome and that affects healing. So obviously if you, you go from a very virulent uh, bacterial microbiome to one that's less virulent, then we will see a more rapid healing. And that's something we see in our research literally every day. The second mechanism of action is energy production on a cellular level. And this brings us to the mitochondria and the mitochondria need oxygen in order to function normally. We know that on the surface of the mitochondria, they have an enzyme called cytochrome C oxidase, and it's an oxidase. So obviously it needs oxygen in order to function. And you know that in a low oxygen environment, mitochondria do not function normally. Just briefly, uh, not to do too much biochemistry, make everybody nervous, uh, my, mitochondria take in glucose and then go through that Krebs cycle and um, produce ATP, ad adenosine triphosphate, which is the cellular energy, now, obviously very important to healing. If we have a wound that um, in which the mitochondria are not functioning uh, well, uh, then obviously the we're not going to, the cells will not function at a normal level. Now, uh, how do we know that oxygen stimulates mitochondria? Well, we have some animals, preclinical studies, which show that in a low oxygen environment, 
that you don't have produce a lot, and mitochondria don't produce a lot of ATP. But in normal baric environment, and I would say that hyperbaric uh, or, or uh, increased oxygen tension induced by topical oxygen, or in this case, hyperbaric as well, uh, would increase the amount of energy production. This is going to make your cells more efficient. And if you look at some of the histologic studies that have been done, and you look at the, the way the wound heals in various, uh, you know, various oxygen environments, so low oxygen environment versus high, the histologically, uh, and this study been done in animals as well, uh, histologically, the, the wounds have much better healing and more cells, they have uh, 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 more vessels when you when you heal a wound in a higher oxygen environment. Can topical oxygen really have this effect? Well, you know, there's been some work done that demonstrates that that continuous diffused oxygen can raise the oxygen tension in a wound uh, to uh, to over 200 millimeters of mercury, and that's and that is significant. So yes, the answer is uh, that this is entirely uh, possible. I also mentioned uh, the uh, growth of new blood vessels or angiogenesis. So. Uh, topical oxygen in one study was also found to upregulate vascular endothelial growth factor, which we all know as VEGF. VEGF, VEGF is a growth factor that strongly supports the d- development of new blood vessels or angiogenesis. Our third mechanism of action is accelerated wound closure. And, and this is something I've seen personally uh, and uh, uh, not an RCT. This is anecdotally, but animal studies have really shown that uh, that if you put topical oxygen on a wound, uh, that you're going to increase epithelization. In this particular study, they, they quoted 70%. And uh, in my human studies, uh, in our clinical trials, we've also noted that uh, adding topical oxygen to a venous leg ulcer, like you see here on your left, it not only uh, increases epithelization, but decreases pain. Those two, I believe, are related. Now, this is something we're actively studying right now. So at the next webinar, we'll be able to give you more information on uh, exactly uh, how that might work. Uh, but right now, we are looking at topical oxygen in the treatment of a wound like a venous leg ulcer that is going to require epithelization. Got a nice granular base. We've reduced the bacterial burden. I can tell you that in this particular wound, uh, we've we've taken the uh, bacterial burden below what we call the chronic inhibitory bacterial level or CIBL. And at this point, you can get this wound to close if you can get epithelization. And topical oxygen, I think, is going to play an important role moving forward in these types of wounds. This is just a case of one of my cases, and you can see you have a, a venous leg ulcer uh, adding uh, topical oxygen promotes epithelization. I'm sorry, this doesn't project real well, but you can see this inframelliolar venous leg ulcer. It's, it's got a nice granular base. We've, we've reduced the bacterial burden here. Uh, we have, um, uh, we've uh, reduced the inflammation. We've done all the good wound care prep and, uh, and as part of that added topical oxygen therapy, and you get epithelization as a result of that topical oxygen therapy. This is a uh, this is a case study that we did uh, in a patient uh, with a, a diabetic foot ulcer. Uh, this is before we did our diabetic foot ulcer trials. You know, typically when you're doing clinical trials, what we'll do is a, a proof of concept trials. And we just find patients in the wound clinic and we throw tropical oxygen, in this case, on the wounds. And, and we, we treated a variety of wounds not just diabetic foot ulcers, but this was one we were hoping that we'd treat a number of diabetic foot ulcers and um, and uh, uh, they would address. Adri- so the choice here was w- whether to use HBO or uh, uh, or epidermal. We had planned HBO for this patient. We used topical oxygen and you can see that the patient um, uh, did really, really well. Again, I'm, I don't think that topical oxygen and hyperbaric compete. If they don't in my clinic, topical oxygen is really for Wagner one and two ulcerations. That's where the clinical trials, our clinical trial focused on primarily Wagner two ulcers uh, and uh, our hyperbaric uh, patients are Wagner three ulcers. And there's good meta-analysis for hyperbaric or Wagner threes. It's just a matter of classifying your ulcers appropriately and using therapy that has evidence-based. So ones and twos, topical oxygen, threes, hyperbaric oxygen, different mechanism of action. We've talked about using them in concert. I have not done that. Uh, to any large degree, uh, so that I don't have any good evidence to present. I, I knew that was, I know that was going to be a question, but I haven't done it yet, although people have talked about it, and I'm sure that's something that our research group will do in the future.
Uh, here's a case study from our diabetic foot ulcer clinical trial. And you can see a patient uh, with a Wagner 2 uh, diabetic uh, foot ulcer uh, and uh, debridement offloading uh, with a total contact cast. Uh, we redu we'd already reduced the mi microbial burden below the Sybil level. And now uh, we're, uh, we're going to apply topical oxygen. And I think these are a little bit out of order, um, uh, but uh, actually the response was very nice, was very nice. And we got the patient to complete closure. Uh, we had a, a large number of these patients. I really, I'm gonna step aside to say the last clinical trial in the meta-analysis, um, we actually took the uh, Medicare's national coverage determination and we followed it so that uh, all the patients in the study would have qualified for advanced therapy, 40 day, uh, four weeks of standard of care uh, with non-healing more than 40%. And that standard of care was aggressive treatment, total contact casting, moist wound healing, reduction of bacterial burden, truly a standard of care. And if you heal by more than 40%, you're out of the trial. So uh, those these patients that entered that trial were were truly candidates for advanced therapy, and you and you'll see a significantly greater healing rate for uh, patients uh, and patients in the, the who were uh, treated with topical oxygen, and that's true in all the trials you see in the meta analysis. And we put them all together, and uh, they are all consistent, and that's great. That's what you like to see. The re particularly the recent trials that have been done ha have had consistent healing rates uh, for uh, difficult patients. Oftentimes, uh, clinical investigators uh, have been criticized for enrolling patients in clinical trials that aren't our patients. They're not the patients that come in the wound clinic. Not true in this case. These are patients that would have qualified for advanced wound care in your wound clinic. They would, they would, you know, if uh, topical oxygen had uh, reimbursement at that point, they would have been able to, uh, you've been able to order it. All right, so I'm going to end here. This is my email. Uh, certainly interested uh, uh, to have any questions that you can put in the chat box. You can email me directly if you like. Love to answer questions. And I think you're really going to enjoy uh, the remainder of the lecture. Dr. Carter is going to speak about meta-analysis, and, and she just did a brilliant job on this meta-analysis. And then uh, Charles Anderson will also demonstrate some cases using uh, topical uh, oxygen. And, and everybody knows Chuck Anderson, one of the it's truly key opinion leaders in our field. Thank you very much, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Carter. Welcome to this symposium. My name is Dr. Marissa Carter, and today I'm going to be talking about a systematic review of meta-analysis for diabetic foot ulcer treatments using CDO. And these are my disclosures. And we have three learning objectives. Um, the first one is how did we actually do the meta-analysis? How was it accomplished for this particular CDO review? Second thing is, what are the key differences between our meta-analysis and this recently published Australian meta-analysis? And the two references there are at the bottom of the, your screen. And finally, what are the key findings of our systematic review and all the statistics that support it? So let's begin by talking about what are the elements of this particular CDO meta-analysis. And the first one is data input. In fact, we do an awful lot of planning for any kind of meta-analysis because meta-analysis is rarely done by itself. It's always part of a systematic review. And the data for this particular meta-analysis was done by a couple of our team. Um, they created with the rest of the team data extraction tables and filled them in. And the kinds of data that they filled in that we would need for meta-analysis are first of all, the outcomes, which were complete wound healing at 12 weeks, um, the number in each group and the percentage healed. They also identified and quantified some of the missing outcome data. Next, they included some safety analysis. And part of this actually contributes to the sensitivity analysis we'll talk about in just a little bit. They also, how did the study name and year, what kind of study design it was. And they also make notes on particular issues that they found with each study. And finally, they did what's called a risk of bias analysis for each study. And we'll talk about that in a little bit too. The next part of the meta-analysis is model selection. And we have typically, before we start any analysis as part of our plan, 
what we're actually going to do. And typically it says uh, we will select certain kinds of model types and have a nice set of rules to do meta-analysis. And that includes this thing, which I get asked every time to talk about, and that is statistical heterogeneity. So I'm just gonna remind you what that is. And if you look at the diagram on the right-hand side, this is just um, a fictional diagram, but it illustrates what I want to show you. And that is, if you remember in meta-analysis, uh, those blue squares that you see represent the weights of each individual study, the diamond, uh, there is the overall pulled effect and the width of the diamond. And also these lines here represent the 95% confidence intervals. And you'll note in this particular diagram, these three are showing roughly the same kind of odds ratio, but this one's literally out in left field. And in fact, if I calculated the statistical heterogeneity on this one, it would be huge. And, and it would be obvious, you know, if you took this one out, you wouldn't have it. So that's one of the sources and one of the ways heterogeneity can manifest itself, but it's not the only one. So if we do find heterogeneity in a meta-analysis, we have to figure out where is it coming from? Next step is I do a lot of graphical plots and the ones I'm most interested in, and they're not the only ones I do, are called funnel and lab A plots. These are really representations of response by intervention type versus size or the number of individuals or participants in a trial and the treatments, response versus precision. And also in the case of the funnel plot, what we call publication bias. So these are additional sources of information that I use to tell what is the meta-analysis actually telling us. And finally, we do what's called a sensitivity analysis. And those of you who do know quite a bit about wound care do know that in typical randomized control trials, especially, we miss a certain amount of outcomes. And that happens because patients die, uh, they go to hospital, we lose track of them and they, they get withdrawn for various problems. So we want to figure out and impute that data to see how that might change the meta-analysis. So the next step is we actually do the meta-analysis and work through various issues that are presented to us. So in this particular CDO meta-analysis, I use what's called a random effects model. And it was chosen because we had significant heterogeneity. And when I looked at the source of the heterogeneity, it turned out to be a single study. And in fact, you'll see that in some diagrams in a minute. I also looked at the funnel and lab A plots, and there was some asymmetry in, in, in regard to what we call the size versus treatment effects. But most of these were expected, and there are only one or two things that um, I want to comment on when I show you the diagrams. And finally, I did the sensitivity analysis, and, and we showed, and as I will show you the data in a moment, missing outcomes, it turns out in this particular case, are not a significant factor. So I'm going to show you the results in terms of diagrams. So over here on the left, and this is required anytime you do um, a systematic review, what you're going to identify is all the records that you looked at and extracted, um, how you looked at them, uh, how many reports you retrieved and decided you're going to use, why you didn't you know, look at certain ones, the reasons and so on like that. And with the, the final box showing, these actually the number of studies in the review and the number of included studies, which were four. This diagram here, if you've never seen one before, is called a forest plot. And two things to note about it. Um, relative risk is our scale. And in this case, on the right-hand side, as we go from one to 10, that shows increasing positive treatment effect. This would be negative going here. And what you're looking at is differences for each study expressed as a ratio. And as I remember from what I said earlier, these are the weights of the individual studies. These are the 95% confidence intervals for all of the studies. This is the pooled effect. And if you take the centroid of that diamond, that blue diamond, and you were to drop it down, if I could just get that here, it'll come out to about here. So 
definitely because it's actually all above one, um, that's, a, that's a significant effect. Over here is a funnel plot. And funnel plots typically have the same scale, We've got relative risk going on here. But we have something called standard error. And that is a measure of the variance that you see. And variance really is, um, how, does, how is the data distributed is, is the best way to think about it. Is it hugely distributed all over the place or is it very tight? And in general, uh, the lower the standard of error, obviously zero, you never get zero, but this is increasing standard of error and, and plotted against relative risk. You can see where these four studies come at. And generally speaking, the smaller the study, the bigger the standard of error or the higher the variance. And you can see that's generally true. This is actually the driver study where we can see relative risk was only marginally above one. Um, and it's not unexpected, you know, when you look at the details. So there's nothing here that looks bad or makes me worry. And this particular forest plot looks actually very good. We also wanted to look at our results versus an Australian meta-analysis. And that was one of two that came out over the last two or three years. So these are all the studies that are common or you know, cited between the two, two studies and what the, the ticks and the crosses show, which ones are included. So for example, in our meta-analysis, we had four studies. These are the three ones here were not included. Whereas in the Australian meta-analysis, all the studies except Serena 221 wasn't included in it, simply because systematic review at that time, that particular study hadn't published. And the other two studies, why didn't we include them? Well, part of our pre-specified outcomes in terms of selecting studies is that first of all, the outcomes had to be at 12 weeks, which there wasn't any data. And finally, it was below 20. Um, and, and usually I say that small sample sizes and, and, and 20 is somewhat arbitrary, but it has some statistical meaning, are too small to tell us anything. And again, this is like this particular study had the same issues and which is another reason why we didn't include it. And what are the key differences that we found? Well, I have to tell you the Australian study is flawed for a lot of reasons. Um, the first most important one is they actually combined two study results from the same study. In other words, they took the per protocol results, which are a subset of the intent to treat results, and they combined them. And I don't know why they did that. Um, the second most important problem is they combined studies that didn't have the same study period. So if, for example, you have outcomes over eight weeks and 12 weeks, and you combine the two, that's a no-no. They also included two small studies of what I call very dubious quality. So consequently, I don't trust the results. And this to me is a little bit sad because these are very elementary mistakes that you would expect a beginner in meta-analysis to make. But clearly they did not have a statistician on the team. And this is embarrassing. I, I would hate to have this kind of thing with my name on it. The other difference is we should note that the Australian study used an older Cochrane risk of bias tool, where, whereas ours was the most concurrent, and it's only like a year or two old. And actually, there's big differences between those two particular versions. We also used a great approach, which is now considered the gold standard of analysis for systematic reviews. And finally, our sensitivity analysis was far more comprehensive. So what are the findings from our particular meta-analysis? So again, we chose a random effects model. The, the actual heterogeneity is me measured by something called the I-squared index, and it runs from zero to 100%. It's marginally statistically significant. I mean, in theory, I could have done a fixed model effects. You would have got a much nicer result, but I chose to be conservative because I didn't want people to say, oh, well, you know, she is coasting or sailing too close to the wind. So the reason is, is to be conservative, I ended up using the random effects model. As I said earlier, the origin for the heterogeneity here that you see was the driver's study. When you emitted it, it practically goes to zero. Um, 
the pooled results, um, even though we use this random effects model, are still statistically significant. You've got a relative risk of 1.6 and you've got a p-value though 0 0.02. Now, the funnel plot suggested the magnitude, the, the, the effect size, if you like, of the intervention response varied with the degree of precision. In other words, we typically saw larger studies and smaller effects, and I showed you that in the diagram earlier. And when we did the sensitivity analysis per the way we'd actually written in the plan before we did it, we noticed that uh, we still had a statistically significant result. So overall, these are all very good findings and I'm very encouraged by what we found. In terms of risk of bias analysis, this is you can think of this analogously as a rigorous way of looking at study. Uh, what is it flaws? And these are the ones that you really want to, to find out. These would be high risk. And you have sometimes have some medium risk or some risk, as we say, and some at low risk where they're all good to go in all the domains you looked at. And our studies show we had one low risk and the others had some risk. In addition, these are our grade ratings. The overall grade rating is based on five different domains, this risk of bias and precision and consistency, indirectness and publication bias. And these are actually, there were three of us on the panel and these are our individual readings. They're reasonable agreement. And, and we all unhesitatingly agreed that the evidence was moderate for the grade, which is the second highest level of evidence that you can get in a grade context. So some final comments about this whole thing. As I said earlier, meta-analysis should always be done with a systematic review and preferentially a grade approach to the whole thing. As I showed you earlier uh, with the results of the Australian study, meta-analysis is not easy. You think it's very much a point and click kind of thing. And it's very easy to make very elementary mistakes and make yourself look silly. The most important thing is the plan that you create. It's analogous to a statistical analysis plan you'd use for a clinical trial. A meta-analysis is not about just chasing p-values, just the same reason it's not about chasing p-values in a clinical trial when you do uh, statistics. What you're really trying to find out is look at all the aspects of the meta-analysis and ask it to tell you what is actually happening. What are you learning? In other words, you do it all the different ways you can with all the additional graphs and so on and get a lot of more insight before you finally start to say, these are the conclusions. And the, the thing I will always say, and you will always hear me say in every lecture is, if you're doing this for the first time, you're really not sure what you're doing, get a statistician on your team. Well, thanks for listening. If you have any questions, write them down because at the end of our three sessions, we're going to have a question and answer session and I will be happy to answer your questions then. My name is Chuck Anderson. I'm a vascular surgeon by trade. Currently, I'm chief of the wound care service at Madigan Army Medical Center. We're uh, continuing our discussion on topical oxygen therapy. Uh, disclosures, I am a consultant for EO2. Uh, we're not going to discuss any unapproved uses of topical oxygen therapy during this presentation. And also, I work for the U.S. government, so it's important that the messages that I uh, share in this uh, presentation are my opinions and not the opinions of the U.S. Army or Department of Defense. Our learning objectives for this part of the presentation are to discuss the difference between the meta-analysis and the guidance document, why they are both significant, and also demonstrate when and how to use topical oxygen therapy based on published data and clinical experience. The meta-analysis uh, was a very important study, and uh, you already heard as part of this uh, uh, webinar a presentation on the meta-analysis. It's a key that uh, when we look at the meta-analysis, there was a very specific objective. The objective was to conduct, conduct a systemic review 
and meta-analysis of the recently published randomized controlled trials that employed the use of topical oxygen therapy as an adjunct therapy in the treatment of Wagner 1 and 2 diabetic foot ulcers. The literature was reviewed from 2010 with four RCTs included in the meta-analysis. The conclusions were that this data supports the use of topical oxygen therapy for the treatment of chronic Wagner 1 or 2 diabetic foot ulcers in the absence of infection and ischemia. As I say, this is a limited population. Uh, it was, uh, the studies are very good and certainly show a benefit in this specific, in this specific po population. The guidelines uh, were uh, uh, de developed using the Delphi consensus uh, method, a well-established method for uh, uh, developing guidelines. Uh, there uh, were uh, 15 wound specialists uh, that participated, uh, including myself, in the development of, uh, of these guidelines. So the... Uh, the guidelines uh, go through a number of things, and I'm just going to touch some of the highlights. This is, is what the uh, guidelines suggest should be documented prior to ordering topical oxygen therapy. And you can see the numbers of consensus with the uh, panel that developed the uh, guidelines. Assessment of limb perfusion, i.e. an ABI or TBI, clinical assessment of bacterial load, nutritional assessment, debridement, edema management, and offloading of the diabetic or pressure ulcers. Uh, also in the guidelines, total topical oxygen therapy should be considered for delayed wound healing, failure of prior therapies, and ischemic ulcers following all efforts to revascularize the affected area. Wounds most likely to benefit from uh, topical oxygen therapy, uh, according to the uh, panel that participated, uh, diabetic foot ulcers, venous leg ulcers, and ischemic ulcers. So this is a flow sheet that uh, we developed uh, as part of that uh, publication. And again, starting at the top, that uh, wounds that have failed four weeks of therapy have not uh, shown uh, 40% closure or more are to be considered. We've also already identified those studies that uh, need to be obtained prior to initiating uh, topical oxygen therapy. At uh, four weeks, uh, the therapy should be reassessed. If the wound is improving, then it's appropriate to continue topical oxygen therapy. If there's no improvement, then uh, we need to reassess and and look at other factors that may be negative factors for the failure of that wound to heal. So what is the value of the meta-analysis and guidelines? Uh, the current meta-analysis is very important. It's important in the attempt to secure reimbursement for this therapy. It's also very important for providers to support that this is a therapy that works and should be considered in clinical practice. The guidelines are helpful in determining exactly where topical oxygen therapy may be useful in clinical practice. Uh, this is another paper that uh, uh, I wrote with Dr. Arapola. Uh, again, we looked at uh, the literature and papers that had documented the use of topical oxygen therapy in various wound types and uh, reported uh, uh, good outcomes. So based on that, uh, we added to the list of wound types that uh, where topical oxygen therapy could be considered. Diabetic wounds, vascular ulcers, post-surgical infections, pressure injuries, amputation, amputations and infected stumps, skin grafts, cellular tissue-based products, prevention of wound dehiscence, ischemic tissue, burns, and frostbite. So a very large list of wounds that have been shown uh, in studies to benefit from topical oxygen therapy. So I wanna run through some case studies. These are all my cases. I think it's very important that uh, when we look at the meta-analysis and, and the guidelines, uh, 
those of us involved in day-to-day -day practice of wound care uh, know that the majority of our patients don't quite fit into certainly the meta-analysis or even the guidelines. So this is experience uh, with other cases uh, that were unique cases and all benefited from the use of topical oxygen therapy. Uh, case studies, and I'm going to quickly run through uh, four case studies, a large painful neuroischemic ulcer, a very chronic wound with exposed foreign body, a chronic wound post irradiation for breast cancer, and topical oxygen therapy utilized as an adjunct in the reconstructive pathway for a major surgical site complication. So this is more of an acute wound. So patient one, a 79 year old male, an acute onset uh, of an exacerbation of, of his congestive heart failure leading to severe bilateral lower extremity edema with blistering, uh, ultimately resulting in a very large, very painful left lower extremity wound that was not responding uh, after four weeks, more than four weeks of standard wound care. So in this case, uh, topical oxygen therapy was initiated for two reasons. Certainly one is for the wound healing. This patient also had very severe pain associated with his ulceration requiring narcotics. So here you see the wound, uh, a large five by five centimeter wound. This is when topical oxygen uh, uh, was uh, initiated. We used the continuous diffusion oxygen system with the oxyspur dressing. Uh, this patient had almost instantaneous pain relief. By the time he left the clinic and got home, uh, his pain was relieved. He was able to get off from no narcotics. It was interesting that after he'd been on therapy for a period of time and the wound was uh, decreasing uh, to a very manageable wound, he said, well, uh, why don't we just go back to the regular dressings and I don't have to uh, carry around this small unit. So we stopped the therapy, put a dressing on. He went down to the lab for some x-rays and lab studies, came back to our clinic indicating that the pain was back. So we reinitiated the therapy, continued the therapy until the wound was healed. He had no recurrence of his pain after the wound was healed and the wound remained healed. So this is five days of topical oxygen therapy, 30 days, 60 days with the wound healed. Patient two, this is a neuroischemic ulcer. This is an 81 year old male with diabetes, severe PAD with history of an injury to the left ankle from a brace. Uh, he had an attempted flap closure of the ulcer. Unfortunately, that uh, flap uh, did not work and the patient ended up with a larger wound. Uh, he developed it uh, subsequently ischemic rest pain, uh, was taken for a common femoral endarterectomy and bilateral iliac stents. Uh, unfortunately, he then developed osteomyelitis uh, under this wound, uh, required resection and placement of bone cement. He then continued uh, with his uh, chronic wound. He had another vascular procedure, more distal in the leg. Unfortunately, this did not heal the wound. He continued with a very chronic wound with exposed uh, cement and total oxygen therapy was initiated. So here you can see the wound on the edge there where the arrow is pointing, it is a bone and bone cement. So again, the oxy spur dressing and uh, the topical oxygen therapy. Uh, here you can see 10 December, 17 December, 26 December, 2 January, 9 January, and 15 January. So a wound that had been a very, very problematic uh, uh, was healed in 40 days. And this had, uh, I followed this patient very carefully uh, for subsequent evaluation of his vascular disease. And he's had no recurrence of this wound. Patient three, a very challenging patient. Again, those of us working in the wound care clinics know that when you have a, a patient that's had a radiation, those wounds can be very, very problematic in, in getting those wounds to uh, heal. So this young lady had bilateral mastectomies with post-operative post irradiation to the right breast, uh, 
uh, with a resulting suture line complication and a chronic wound that developed, as you see in the uh, photograph. This had been present for several months. Uh, the decision was made to uh, initiate topical oxygen therapy. Uh, we also use the near infrared spectrometry, and we uh, use this to monitor the tissue oxygenation while we were doing uh, topical oxygen therapy. So here you uh, see the wound uh, and uh, you see the uh, uh, oxygen levels are low in the wound going along uh, with the irradiation therapy. Uh, here, 32 days, a significant decrease in the size of the wound and a significant increase in the oxygenation of that tissue. Here at 60 days, the wound is healed. And you can see now oxygen levels up to 84% of interest. We subsequently uh, uh, followed this patient to make sure there was no recurrence uh, and uh, continued to measure the oxygen levels in that tissue. And uh, even though we were not uh, employing oxygen therapy uh, at that point in time, the tissue oxygenation levels uh, remained high. Patient four is a major surgical site complication. And it illustrates that topical oxygen can be an important adjunct in the pathway of reconstruction of acute complex tissue defects. This case involved a very aggressive MRSA infection following a cervical laminectomy with underlying hardware. So a 56-year-old male, Parkinson disease, with a cervical laminectomy, complicated, as I said, by a very severe surgical site complication, required uh, debridements in the operating room and uh, was treated with uh, IV antibiotics for a, a prolonged period of time. When we initially saw him in the wound care clinic, it was two months after his uh, initial uh, uh, operation with development of the uh, complication. We initially treated him with uh, additional local debridement silver alginate, some absorptive dressing. Uh, again, with the exposed hardware in the base of the wound, we initiated uh, negative pressure therapy to see if we could get granulation tissue to grow over that uh, uh, hardware. So this was the reconstructive pathway. Uh, initially, IV antibiotics, surgical debridement, then oral antibiotics, silver alginate dressing for a short period of time, 30 days of negative pressure wound therapy, uh, resulting in granulation tissue covering the hardware, and then two months of topical oxygen therapy for closure of that wound. So as you can see, uh, this is a, a large wound, and you can see the exposed hardware here in the base of the wound. What you can't appreciate with this photograph is there's undermining, uh, very significant undermining around this wound. So this is after 20 days of uh, negative pressure wound therapy. You can see that uh, there's new uh, epithelium growing. It's also uh, important at this point to realize that the flaps are now stuck down, so there's no undermining. Uh, this is 30 days. Again, you can see the outline of where the wound was, so we've made significant progress. Uh, this patient uh, with his negative pressure wound therapy and with his underlying uh, uh, cervical disease was having severe pain. And then uh, because of the potential benefit of topical oxygen therapy with pain management, we decided to switch from negative pressure wound therapy to topical oxygen therapy. So here you again, 30 days of negative pressure wound therapy. This was after the first 20 days of topical oxygen therapy. And again, you can see a significant decrease in the size of that wound. And this is 60 days of topical oxygen therapy with the wound closed. This wound has not reoccurred. Uh, once we initiated the topical oxygen therapy, the patient was able to get off from narcotics and, and is now uh, doing well and not requiring any uh, narcotics for his cervical spine disease. So this is... Uh, where we started with the topical oxygen therapy, and this is uh, where we ended up. So in conclusion, uh, you've heard several presentations in this uh, webinar presentation. Uh, 
So topical oxygen therapy ha has been uh, uh, shown to be uh, very beneficial in animal studies. It's been shown to be beneficial in uh, very well-designed randomized controlled studies. The meta-analysis, again, gives uh, additional uh, evidence that uh, this is a therapy that works uh, uh, for defined wounds. The guidelines uh, suggest that uh, uh, where we could use topical oxygen therapy, I mentioned another paper that we uh, uh, published that kind of expand those uses. And I can tell you in our clinical practice, in the most difficult wounds, challenging wounds, this is proven to be a, a very beneficial therapy. Thank you for your time. Really super interesting uh, uh, presentations. And we have, uh, I'm gonna open it up with a couple of questions. And I'll start with uh, Dr. Carter. So uh, any idea why the variance in, was so little in the topical oxygen studies? I mean, if you look at the later studies, the one that were done after the driver, it seems like there's a lot, there's, there's a fairly small amount of variance. And that, that's the question, but it, it, this, the caveat to that, the follow-up is, uh, does that mean we're getting better at this? I mean, you know, we've been trying, we've been trying for a long time to get better at this trial stuff. I think so. I mean, you know, you can see one of the arguments we wrote in our paper was um, during the um, the first trial, Dr. Driver and her associates worked on, there were clearly problems with the device. I mean, I actually had, had worked a little bit on the statistics of that trial. And with the later design and, and the different kinds of um, devices that came on in the market and what we learned, you know, from getting it right in the first place, yeah, you can certainly see that um, the variance came down, the results started to look a little more consistent. So I think it's two things, better CDO devices, um, learning from how to do trials better. Oh, great. Well, that, that's what I wanted to hear. I don't know. if the, I hope that answered the, 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 the question. Uh, I'm sure it did. Uh, so um, uh, the next question is, I think you may have already answered this, Chuck, with the, the, the fourth example, but I, I wrote the question down before then. When, and do you ever prescribe it for pain? We've seen the same thing as far as pain is concerned. We see this big drop in pain when we put it on, particularly venous ulcers. But uh, I think you probably already answered this question with the fourth example. But I like it. I certainly want you to comment on it uh, and uh, prescribing oxygen for pain control as well, Celia. Uh, absolutely. And quite honestly, that's been a major factor in us selecting the uh, topical oxygen therapy. When we have a, a, especially a large, very chronic wound, if they have associated significant pain requiring narcotics, we're much more likely to initiate the topical oxygen and with very, very good results. And that there's, uh, when I was at World Union this year, there was a, a Scandinavian uh, student uh, from Karolinska who presented a, uh, you know, a small trial, but it was uh, showing exactly what you and I have uh, both seen. I guess the question is, uh, is why? And I, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know if, <laughs> if Dr. Carter or uh, Dr. Anderson, you have any ideas, but it's, it's, it's real. We certainly have seen it quite frequently. No, you're right. Because, I mean, you know, I think venous leg ulcers are probably more painful than almost any other kind of ulcer, except maybe one or two exceptional ones. So it's the process that, you know, the, the wound goes through the healing. If you could imagine, and is that a painful process in general? It shouldn't be. But, you know, there are clearly things that we don't know when you interact um, or when things are unsatisfactory that cause that pain. And then the fascinating thing to me, you know, which, which I'd, I'd like to open the floor to is, what are we changing in terms of pain producing entities when we um, use CDO devices? Very, very good question. It's interesting when, when you first initiate topical oxygen, you see a change in the appearance of the wound. Oftentimes that wound becomes much more exudative instead of being that dry you know, wound that, that has more of a propensity for a wound, you see a lot more activity. I think Dr. Serena did a, just an outstanding job as she always does, uh, going through the science of uh, uh, the uh, topical uh, wound uh, therapy. But uh, I, I think it may be 
as, as simple as what occurs mechanically to that wound along with the uh, stimulated uh, factors that you uh, summarized very well, Tom. Yeah, you know, I, you treat more ischemic ulcers than I do, um, Chuck. I just, ha have you seen this with arterial ulcers or those with poor perfusion? Have you seen that same reduction in pain? Uh, not as much actually as just very large painful ulcers. The, yeah. the ischemic, uh, as you and I discussed many times when we were reviving, when we were writing the, uh, the guidelines, you know, we make every attempt to, to try to address the ischemia. And usually one way or the other, we can, uh, we can address the ischemia. So we haven't used topical oxygen very much on pure ischemic ulcers. Uh, the neuro ischemic ulcers are uh, very different and, and oftentimes a uh, uh, different kind of pain. Yeah, all right. Uh so uh, I, you know, the other interesting thing was the uh, was the um, uh, radiation injury, uh, which I thought, which I think it's basically, I think of those as an ischemic ulcer as well. I, the question I had was, how far out was that patient? Was this this uh, was she months out, weeks out? Uh, where was she after the uh, after the uh, chest wall radiation? So she was a couple of months out from her mastectomy and radiation therapy had been treated for approximately 30 days uh, with uh, more uh, routine uh, uh, wound care without any response, literally no response. And, and I must say, looking at the groups of patients that we treat, uh, those that are, are uh, status post irradiation, they're very, very difficult patients, but they also respond to topical oxygen. Great. Well, you know, I think based on the uh, the guidelines that you you showed, uh, uh, Chuck, I I really and the, and the work that uh, Marissa has done here with the uh, with the meta analysis, uh, it really speaks to you know getting broad coverage for um, this across uh, you know uh, across both federally and across the max uh, on the professional side, and uh, that's something that's been slow to to uh, to come about, and uh, of course we. Uh, we we don't want to say anything bad about the government, but the uh, uh, and please don't. <laughs> but um, uh, you know, I, I think uh, I would say that the evidence presented today really speaks for a, a broad coverage of this therapy at, in order to put it into our clinic so we can tr improve our patients' uh, overall healing. Another, we need more tools, there's no doubt. And I'll leave uh, uh, I'll leave you both to make your final comments before we have to close it out. Um, I actually sat in, <clears throat> was invited to be a part of a panel in the 2019 MedCAC, and you could see there, you know, and I can't tell you exactly what happened in detail, but I can tell you there was definitely something going on, but a lot of people had um, dubious opinions, there were results and so forth. So in a sense, what, you're, what you were seeing then is the beginning of something, but we needed more trials. And, and Tom, when you finished your trial and so on like that, you know, this is the, the extra kind of trials and data and results that we needed to, to push us over the fence. You know, I think, Tom, what, what you say is we have the animal studies that support the, that this does indeed provide better tissue oxygenation. We have the uh, well-controlled uh, clinical trials. We have the meta-analysis. Uh, and we have clinical experience. And I think with all of that combined, I feel very strongly that this is therapy that uh, we need to have covered and available to more of our uh, patients, uh, especially with those large wounds, uh, not responding to other therapies. And if they have uh, also associated pain, there's, there's a very, very significant benefit. All right, we've gone a little bit over. Uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Anderson, Dr. Carter. A uh, uh, terrific program on uh, CDO. And uh, if, you, uh, if you have questions, I think uh, the George or uh, David can, will follow up. And uh, certainly, be, I'd be glad to answer. All of us will be glad to have, answer any questions that you might have. But with that, uh, uh, we'll sign off. And thank you very much. Thank you for organizing this. Yeah. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, uh, Marissa.